So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome from Iowa. I'm sitting in the gallery at the Iowa Quilt Museum in Winterset, and we are so happy to welcome you to this virtual um, gallery walk of the Out of Control exhibit. My name is Megan Barrett, and I am the director here at the Iowa Quilt Museum, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. Uh, we have with us uh, Barbara Brackman and Deb Rowden from Kansas, who curated this collection for us, and special guests Julie Silber and Joe Cunningham from the San Francisco Bay Area. And we're so excited because we've got a lot of fantastic quilts to look at. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick 60 second overview of the Iowa Quilt Museum, uh, assuming that some of you have never been here before. We're located in historic uh, Madison County, Iowa. That's the same Madison County made famous by the Bridges of Madison County book, movie, and musical. We are also the birthplace of actor John Wayne. And so there is a museum here dedicated to that as well, just down the street from us. In addition to that, we have this beautiful uh, late 19th century courthouse as the cornerstone of our town square, fantastic shopping district, um, and the entire downtown district is on the National Historic Registry. So it's a beautiful place to come and visit for shopping and exploring. And of course, there's the fantastic Iowa Quilt Museum right in the middle of all of that with two, fan, two wonderful quilt shops just down the street from us on either side. So it's a great place to be, especially if you're a quilter. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the um, museum as we go through things. But I wanna turn things over to our guests and have them start with a little um, introduction of themselves and um, what it is that draws them to certain quilts as a collector. So Barbara, I'm gonna pass things over to you first. This is Barbara Brackman, everybody. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Barbara. Well, I live in Kansas and I have a degree in art history and a degree in psychology. And both have drawn me to these quilts. Uh, and I've been collecting quilts since I was probably in my early 20s and they were at the Goodwill and the thrift stores and antique shops and so I have quite a collection and the quilts that are in this exhibit are some of my favorites, the ones that seem to break every rule that we were ever taught in sewing class. And I, I collect them, I started I collected them because I used them as art in my house and so anything that had a real dramatic visual and an unusual visual really attracted me and I hung them for years um, you know as a big piece of art. So I was never very interested when I first began in the woman who made them. I didn't ask for names. I just said that is a fabulous piece of art. I'm taking that home and I'll give you the whole nine dollars for it <laughs> and uh, I won't argue anymore. So as I got more mature and more sophisticated, I realized I really should have found out more about the, the women who made them. Um, I also, as I just said, I was working for Cookie Newsletter at the time, and I also belonged to a quilt field that was full of some very type A people. And everybody was telling me that my quilts, which I was self-taught and I'm not a very good teacher, my quilts were breaking every rule that they could imagine. And so I got my revenge by writing an article about Quilt Break the Rules for Quilt Digest Press. And then that's sort of what this, this uh, show grew out of, that 30, 40 year old article. And now I live next door to Deborah Allen and she's a very good friend. And so we've been shopping for years together and she has the same eye I do. And she actually, for some reason, she has more wall space than me. Now how is that? I think I got more. But anyway, she always has one or two fabulous So, Deb. Yeah, that's a great segue. Let's segue. Let's pass it over to Deb, who's well, joined literally from right next door. Right next door in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, Barbara and I live on the top of a hill that kind of butts up against the campus, and but it's Kansas, but we can see over a huge valley. It's a lot of fun and. I'm a fifth generation Kansan. Um, I actually kind of grew up in Lawrence, um, but lived all over the world for a while. 
So I would read Quilter's Newsletter magazine because I was a textile graduate from Kansas State University and I dreamed of someday writing about textiles, um, but mostly I just was a journalist for years. And I would notice that Barbara Brackman, when she wrote articles, she liked the quilts I liked. And I was so excited because, you know, back then, well, always there are a lot of rules in quilts. And there are a lot of people who do things like rip out stitches. And, and that always just rankled me. I thought that was wrong. And as soon as I had enough money, I started kind of collecting quilts as well as making them. I've always made them, but um, I got my first ones when I lived in the South back in the 70s. Um, I missed G's Bend. I was in Northern Alabama, but, but I did get a few that some that are in this show. Um, then, and when I, when Barbara and I got to know each other, we just, we would shop. We would run around and shop and we're both on, you know, we don't have a ton of money. So we would just go crazy if we found a really original quilt, you know, that was cost $25, you know, and, and we'd shop until the car was full and then <laughs> come home with them all. And, and you're getting to see a lot of them now. Um, and we're just thrilled, thrilled that, that the exhibit's up and the Iowa Quilt Museum has been so great about showing our quilts. So, so I've been at Point Bonita sewing and Julie Silber would come out and talk to all of us in California. And um, we went crazy about a lot of the quilts that she liked. We even made one, a quilt with words, based on one of the quilts that you showed, Julie. So, so we're just tickled as heck that you guys are joining us today. And I'll turn it over. You guys are making my job easy with all these segues. It's fantastic. Yeah. All right, yeah. so let's pass it over to Julie and hear a little bit from her. Okay, I gotta fix things here. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we guys have known each other a long time and um, share many things, much history and values and aesthetics and all that. It was interesting to me to hear you, Barbara, say that you um, have those two degrees, psychology and art. Um, and that at first, obviously, you were more attracted to the aesthetics than, than the people behind the quilts. You said that, the women behind the quilts. And um, I'm interested in both of those things. Um, and, uh, but I always, right from the beginning, I started collecting quilts in 1966 when I got to California. And I have always um, been intrigued and wanted to know who made the quilt. Um, that I think came first for me, although the aesthetics um, and the draw of the graphics of quilts always um, drew me to them, but I was always interested in what is this? Um, I grew up in a, in a home, we, my parents were art collectors and I went to um, the museums and um, took art history in college and so on. So I was really familiar with the visual arts and I liked them, but when I saw quilts, something else happened to me. It wasn't just in my eyes. Something happened to me in my gut. And in uh, 1966, there wasn't so much written about it, and I didn't know anybody besides my two friends, Linda Ruther and uh, Pat Ferrero, who were here in California uh, with me. Um, I, I just was fascinated by what, what it was about these visual objects that was um, hit me in a more profound way. And so um, my uh, career, um, has that at the center, um, trying to understand, <clears throat> trying to know more about the context of the quilts. Um, unlike I think the rest of you, it took me a little while to come around to the oddities. Um, at first I didn't see any because the only quilts that were available in the very late 60s to me, um, it seemed to me were um, very precise quilts, well-made quilts in great condition. That's what I, w I guess I wasn't frequenting the stories. I was frequenting antique stores, and there weren't very many. But um, it did take me a while. Um, I always loved them, 
and was always drawn to these um, quilts. I, I think the way I would describe it is these quilts, um, although we don't know usually the story, the, the, the actual history of what's behind these quilts, the actual maker, it's rare, rare to get that kind of information. I'm drawn to quilts where I can feel her, where I can feel the woman who made it. Um, she's um, personalized it in some way, even if it's a traditional design, she's made it her own. And I know it when I see it because my heart goes to the top. That's really, really what I can say. Um, I think Joe will uh, appreciate this story. I, <clears throat> when I had the store, we got one of these quilts. We got, we came, came to us and it was birds. Um, and it was just fabulous. It was just a fabulous, but it was very funky. And um, so let me make a distinction here. I'm a quilt dealer. I buy and sell antique quilts. I'm also a collector. And those two categories and piles are two different things. When you have a shop, um, it's very important that the quilts are in very good condition. And um, in the early days, these oddities were not on anybody's radar screen. So I bought that uh, bird's quilt and I loved that bird's quilt, but it never occurred to me to put it out for sale. And then one time Joe um, was visiting me in California and I showed it to him and he loved it and I said, it's yours. You still have it, don't you, Joe? Oh, maybe not. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> you don't have it. You um, actually sold it to me for a very reasonable price because okay. I was buying it as a gift for Gwen Marston. Oh, and I, uh, yeah, so I gave it to Gwen. Well, I'll give you your money back. Blue and red one. Oh, blue no, red. no, but it was very similar to the blue and red one. I flipped my lid. Uh, there wasn't. A, I think it was blue and dun and white. Anyway, it was a fabulous quilt. But I'm um, just uh, my my uh, story is an evolution. I'm sure it is for all of us. But I, I must say that it took me a while um, to really understand that uh, these very personal quilts were, and oddities were, um, had, had as much value in every way as, as the others. So. Joe? Excellent. Oh. <laughs> um, well, uh, I don't have a degree. I, uh, I studied art all my life, but uh, my uh, art teacher in high school explained to me very clearly that I had no talent for visual art. And so I should not uh, pursue my interest in it. So all I did was go to museums and read books and stuff about art. But uh, um, when I ran into quilts in the late 1970s, um, at that time, uh, uh, the people in the magazines, I mean, I every month I would read Barbara Brackman's column. Are you kidding? This was like gold, all this information. And I heard about uh, the famous Julie Silber and the stuff that she was doing. And uh, so these are my heroes. These are the people that, I, oh man, golly. Uh, you know, I felt like writing them fan letters and stuff. So uh, uh, it was really, uh, uh, it, it's been a, a thrill and an honor to get to know these heroes of mine um, and to call them friends. Uh, uh, and I learned, uh, um, my main mentor was Mary Schaefer uh, in the early 1980s, and uh, she was extremely proper. Uh, and she learned how to make quilts by making quilt kits, quilts from kits. And so that when she designed quilts, if you look at Mary Schaefer's quilts in the Quilters Hall of Fame, or anywhere you can find them, you'll see that her quilts look like they were made to be kits. Uh, that, that's, um, that, that's generally her aesthetic. So everything very neatly put together, very uh, highly organized and engineered and so on. And she thought that was the way that every quilt should be. Uh, and I was early on drawn to the more, I thought of them as more artistic quilts, uh, uh, the ones that didn't look like those. And uh, it took me a while to um, uh, come around to making quilts that, uh, 
were more like the ones that I liked. The, and, and the distinction I think that Julia makes is very clear, is very important. Uh, Julia was a quilt dealer. In the 1970s, when this great quilt revival really started, uh, um, the quilts that got all the, the, the notice were the uh, ones that had monetary value. So they were the very neatly made, the very pretty ones, the very ones in perfect condition. The other ones that uh, would be on the table uh, covering up the folding table upon which the nice quilts were would be what my mentor Mary would uh, call a utility quilt. Oh, that's yeah. just a utility quilt. Those were not worth even, they, they had no value. And not only did they have no monetary value, but they had no other value. They couldn't win a prize. They couldn't, uh, you know, quilts like that. What are you supposed to do with them? And, the, and those were the quilts that I was always drawn to. So um, uh, over the years, I came to feel like the, uh, that American quilt making, uh, this form of, of quilts that uh, American women developed in the 1800s, was this really unappreciated uh, uh, explosion of creativity that happened in the 1800s. And because it was non-academic, because there was no money involved, and because it was done by women who, uh, you know, they didn't even go to school for this, uh, these things had no value. And I think even today, uh, it's hard for people to comprehend what a monumental uh, creative endeavor this was and, and, and accomplishment. And um, to me, the most important part of it that has come to be over the years, I've started to feel that the most important aspect of American quilt making was this idea of total creative freedom, that you could make a quilt look like anything you could conceive of, and it's still gonna keep you warm at night. It's, gonna, it's always gonna be a blanket, at least. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's a gift. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It's, it, it's, uh, um, it could look like anything you could think of. And that's the most important thing. And I think that it's been under uh, uh, appreciated because we've been uh, uh, hampered by all these ideas of rules and police and so on. What interesting <laughs> to hear from all of you. Um, and it's, it's great to get to little, know a little bit more about your point of view on these types of quilts and the um, kind of context from which you're coming. Um, we've actually had several more people join our meeting since we started, which is fantastic. We have 99 participants at this point. Um, and we're, we have a cap at 100, so we'll see if we get any more. But um, I just want to take one more quick little um, introduction to where we are and what we're doing today for those who have joined a little bit late in the game. Um, I'm sitting here in the Iowa Quilt Museum. My name is Megan Barrett. I'm the director of the Quilt Museum here in Winterset, Iowa. And we are taking a virtual gallery walk through the um, Out of Control Quilts That Break the Rules exhibit that was curated for us by Barbara Brackman and Deb Rowden of Lawrence, Kansas, with contributions from Julie Silber and Joe Cunningham. Well, um, not necessarily, we don't have quilts of yours in the exhibit, Joe, but um, you are a contributing force, I think, behind this. Um, so we're going to start our walk through the gallery, our virtual walk through the gallery in just a moment. Um, before we do that, I would be remiss if I didn't offer you the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the Quilt Museum um, at our website. I've just typed that link into the chat window. It's iowaquiltmuseum.org. And if you um, like what you're seeing today and you feel like you would like to support our efforts with a small donation, we would be grateful for that. Um, of course, we don't charge admission to these virtual events, um, but if we did do something like this in person, we would anticipate a 10 or $15 ticket to charge for that. Um, so if you feel like you can make a donation in that amount or a greater amount, we would certainly appreciate it because we're very interested in providing more opportunities, more exhibits like this. Um, for the future um, and to keep telling the story of these beautiful American quilts. Um, so with that, I'm going to pull up a screen share um, and shall we just start walking through the gallery? Virtually. Virtually walking through the gallery, yes. Instead of me actually walking my computer around, um, we're just going to pull up some photos here which will enable you to see them without having to get motion sickness. Well, why don't I start by telling you what rule that breaks, and then Deb, who owns it, 
tell you the wonderful story behind it. All right. The rule that is great. the border is supposed to support the blocks, not fight with them. Deb. <laughs> well, uh, this quilt, I, I don't know if we can get any closer to it. Oh, good, we can. Because it's old. It is from the South. I picked it up at an American Quilt Study Group meeting. One of the members brought it. We have an auction there, and, and she offered it for a Deb price of, I think, $10. And I got it. And it's got silk. Look, it's got old blocks that are in the middle of all those stars. I think Joni said there were, ah, there's something like 66 or 67 of stars in this. So obviously when the maker got done putting her stars together, she wanted her quilt to be a little bit wider for the bed, right? So on the ends you can see a lot of work clothes. I mean, this is kind of like the quilts from G's Bin that we see so much of. You know, it's real utilitarian fabrics mixed mixed in with what she had and the back of this quilt is old jeans um, just like the G's bin quilt you see where they took the pockets off and there's fading on the on a quilt um, it's very funky one of my favorite things about this one is that tension between rather precise small pieces in the center that repeat and then the wildness of the border and I always love that contrast um, if it were if it didn't have the border it would be nice but it, it certainly would not be that visual dynamic and it's something that you have to appreciate full out on a wall you know yeah. it's, it's not something you can see folded up or appreciate like you you know you might where it's it even on a bed I think you would not get the dynamic because no, the borders on the sides. So it's a great, it's a great one, and a perfect example of a southern aesthetic. That when I first started looking at quilts, I came from Kansas. My family's from New York, and we didn't know a thing about quilts. But the Kansans, they don't do this. Southerners have more liberty to put things together. And uh, uh, Deb, you're. I is fantastic. I, 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 we've only met briefly, Deb, and I, I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Uh, uh, and through your quilts here, I already like you a lot. I would only say that uh, we don't know. I mean, she might have thought that uh, she needed it to be wider for the bed, but she might also have thought that it needed a fancy border. Well, you know, uh, we don't know. And, true. Uh, oh, true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who knows? She had some more fabric, you know. So, yeah. you know, why not throw it in there? I mean, uh, look, there, there's everything I, ticking, you know, there's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are, are any of the fabrics that are on the border in the interior? I would say yes. Um, you can see that darker green on the border. Yeah. Um, that fades and then and look right in the middle, lower sure. part. Um, uh, likewise, the gray yeah. that's down on the lower right, mm -hmm. it's all through that middle row. Right, right. So, yeah, what did she do? You know, use up the tiny scraps there and then save a bigger piece for the border? I, you know. Who knows? Right. Uh, another thing that I really like about this is that uh, in our modern aesthetic, we uh, really, um, th things have to always seem deliberate, like you made this happen. But in, with quilts like this, if you start on the lower right, the vertical diamonds, I can't tell exactly, is it it's the dark diamonds that go up? Yeah. Along, yes, those along yeah. the vertical right. You can see that she was using this fabric, using that fabric, using that fabric, and then she runs out and switches to the green right there, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and it's like that throughout. She uses one color until she runs it out and then switches to another color. I love it when the quilt makers did that. No design yeah. wall, just plod through it. Yeah, that's right. You have a stack of things right. and you just rip your way through it, yeah. Right. Also another thing to note about some of these quilts that, and this one's fairly old, we guess from early 20th century, is that what we are seeing now is a found object. As Deb's motto was, it's not found, it's art. 
no, it's not trash, it's found, whatever your motto was. But anyway, <laughs> this probably was more red at one time. Mm. Those kind of pale oranges and they're in the center. I wonder if some of those were yeah. Yeah. redder. But red has the synthetic reds had a real tendency to lose color and turn peachy. Like the Congo reds. Yeah. yeah. What do you that's very good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Now were you asking about the fabrics in the border if they were repeated in the center mm -hmm. because uh, you were considering the possibility that somebody else did the border? Uh, just wondering. I'm just in, just investigating like I learned to do in the clues in the calico. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready to move on? Yep. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. I might have to. We can just keep making this one bigger and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Come and get Oh, this one. So I got to tell you, uh, you can kind of tell from the vi from the photo here, but this one is all um, chenille. No, it's corduroy. It's corduroy. corduroy. Okay. Wide whale. Yeah. So it looks like chenille, but it's corduroy. Okay. It really, this is something when you see it in person, you go, oh, <laughs> because that contrast of those stripes, which is just texture, that's not print. Right. Uh, it's just wonderful. Now I'll tell you the rule that this one breaks, and it's a basic rule, pick a pattern and stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll find that several quilts break that particular rule, won't we? Yeah, again, you can see that, you know, your middle, your medallion there right. is kind of a hodgepodge of fabrics. And then the scraps are, you know, repeated out in the two, two sides of it. But in between, she went square and square till she ran out of fabric, it looks like. And the heck with the, the heck with the, you know, grain of the fabric on this one. It just went all over the place, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So my well, I guess that's, that's a rule. When buying wide whale corduroy for your quilts, buy extra so you can match up your grain. <laughs> so if I'm imagining myself making a, a quilt with square and a square, I make as many blocks as I can stand to make. And then I decide that I'm so sick of making square and square blocks, and then how am I gonna lay them out? Well, I've got a strange number of blocks and I can't lay it out quite perfectly. So now, how do I make it work, balance, with the number of squares that I have. So this is how I imagine she ended up with this kind of crazy pieced um, chunk in the center because she just couldn't bring herself to make six more square and a square blocks. That's my, that's my image. Uh, well, there you go. It's, it's always easy to uh, uh, come up with a story. Uh, like, the, I mean, it's, we can, it's tempting to try to analyze why did she do that? Why did she do that? But we really do not know. Uh, I mean, and, it, and it, I do like the fact that it's a medallion quilt. Uh, um, it's that it's a uh, wild, uh, but it's but it it adheres to the formula with a center of focus and a series of borders. Uh, so yeah. by definition, it's a medallion. Yeah. Well, it's you know. It, just in its place, it's just perfect. Yeah, it's a very heavy quilt. <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously, so you can imagine being warm, right? Yeah. Right. That one, you know. Yeah, quilts like this are the original weighted blankets that are all the range now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. All right, can we see another dip? Actually, uh, this quilt came to me from Kathy Sullivan, um, and she won a, a lot of quilts by this maker um, somewhere in Ohio, I believe. I have to get out my notes. I don't have them right now. But it's real, real long, isn't it, Megan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, is it over six feet tall, would we say there? Um, probably close to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see, I mean, it's the, it's the kitchen sink, isn't it? You know, it's got all the little fabrics from, and from different eras, don't you think, Barbara? Yes, I recall. 
Yeah, the deep scrap bag. Deep. I mean, you got all here is yeah. some pieces are too small to fold. <laughs> now, Deb and I at our guild. No. <laughs> We uh, we take the pieces that everybody else thinks might be better as like filling for pet beds at the local humane society. We take <laughs> anything. There's no piece too small to say. Yeah, which she obviously did in this. I don't know. I, this maker also embroidered. You can see down in the lower uh, right corner of this quilt that she embroidered all kinds of things mainly in the corners and they're fancy and they're wonderful and it has a name there's some in the middle that Megan's got yeah so it's kind of a light quilt um you know almost a summer weight it's not thick mm -hmm. um would you go full screen again I mean back out mm -hmm. Megan uh, because this is something that happens a lot with these kind of uh, uh, crazies is it looks like a um, yeah just like it's just a bunch of stuff thrown up there but uh, organizationally it, you can see there's those four sections of vertical bars right mm -hmm. right one and then straight above it and then the other two th th that uh, um, are the center of the four blocks it's like a four block quilt uh each one of those is a center of this whole area of craziness um that you don't even really notice at first um that give it a, as much of an anchor uh as it has and i love that the slash the curved slash along the top that goes yeah to the top. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. fantastic <laughs> So I obviously didn't start at the beginning, but here we, I think we're here now. Now this one's mine and the rule on the, many rules on this one, this is dated 1931 in red embroidery thread. And I imagine once it was red and green and yellow. When I, I bought it online and when I, I received it, I realized the rule being broken here is first you do the applique, then you quilt it. In this one, the applique is laid on top of the quilting. I think what she had was a commercial covering, a bed cover, maybe a moving blanket, and just plain white, and she improved it no end with her applique. Um, and what exuberant applique it is. I bought it from someone who said she found it in an African-American neighborhood in Philadelphia. Quite a ways from me, but... Uh, you can see that Pennsylvania influence. Yeah. yeah. Barbara, are those all one piece? The, yeah, uh, the red? Yeah. Uh -huh. They are. I think yeah. they are. But now the suns aren't. They're two pieces. Right. So have, the bats or butterflies or tulips, they're one piece. Uh, you can see it's embroidered or appliqued down with colored thread. And so there's a little bit of outline that tells you what the original colors in this quilt were. But it's a great thing for me for many reasons. But one is that you can see in 1931, which is awfully late, people were still using that fugitive synthetics, uh, trying to get that red and green look uh, with very little luck because the fabrics were just not, just not color fast enough for, for that look. Then there's the speculation about what are those yellow shapes, right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 I got to tell you, this is one of my favorites here. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is mine also. I have a good friend who will remain nameless, who is has a degree in uh, clothing, textiles, design, and is a professional pattern cutter for a living. And when she went through some of her family things, she found this item in, in her ancestors. And she hated it so much, she just said, here, take it. I never want to see it again. Because it reflects some extremely bad sewing. 
And the rule that's being broken here, it's kind of subtle because you don't often have the question, but you cannot just keep adding yeast as you go left or right. You have to choose a number and stick with it because pretty soon you will wind up with a big circle with the hump in it. So this is probably an 1890, 1910 piece. And, and actually each piece is very well done. It's yes. just the, the counting is so off. So I had to, it's a top. She never finished it. She might've realized where she was headed. But I, I, I just attached it to a mattress cover, you know, a, a, a whole cloth quilt that, so you can see the shape. Cause if you hang it, it just kind of turns itself into sort of a, uh, a cone. So it's, it's flat out there. We had a quilt in a previous exhibit that was an eight pointed star, a lone star giant quilt, and it had nine 60 degree <laughs> sections in it, which you cannot do. And that quilt really, uh, it had a 3D effect because you can't fit nine pieces into an eight pointed Lone Star quilt, or maybe it was seven into six, whatever it was. It was too many well, points. To lay flat. Yes. So, right. There you are again with your rules. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is one of the neatest quilts in our show. Yeah. It really is one of the most precise, except for that little math error. <laughs> right. Just. Uh, uh, it's really interesting how the red squares uh, the vertical line that has the red squares in it, red, blue, red, blue, red, yeah. blue, has the symmetrical uh, uh, finish of the blue and gray top and bottom. You're right. I hadn't noticed that. And those are all the original colors because this has not seen much light or wa any washing. Yeah. Yeah, but she definitely, you know, you, you see things I don't see in the, the planning. Maybe <laughs> you're a planner and I'm not. I'm a mm -hmm. happening. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Marianne Fons, who is um, our <laughs> board member and a fantastic quilter herself, she says, this is the piece in the show that she plans to use for inspiration for a future quilt of her own. She absolutely loves the alternating geese with strips of check alternating with indigo. With apologies to our <laughs> curators and commentators, she plans to make hers with better math. Oh, I was going to say. Better. <laughs> you got to count. I don't see how it could be better. <laughs> not, not better, just with better math. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting segue, though, because we have um, had a docent on our staff, a volunteer, who has made a quilt um, that was inspired actually by the um, corduroy quilt, I believe that we saw earlier, or maybe it wasn't that one. Anyway, and so now this is the second person I've heard of that is going to make a quilt inspired by a quilt in this collection. And so we've been brainstorming. We think we'd like to have a little um, competition of sorts um, where people can submit their quilt tops. They don't need to be finished. Their quilt tops that they've designed um, based on inspiration that's in this exhibit. Um, so we need to figure out exactly the details of how that will come together. But if you see something today that inspires you, we'd love to have you make um, a, a quilt based on it, um, much like the AQSG does their um, annual quilt challenge or semi-annual quilt challenge. If you see something, make something. That's exactly right. I like that, Joe. <laughs> Oh, this is another one of my favorites. I love these these colors. Well, this is again mine. This is one of the first quilts I bought. And this is one I dollars for um, in Wichita. Wichita could be considered part of the South. I, I wonder if it's not Southern. But there, the rule is quilts are supposed to be square or at least, I mean, have 45 or what is that? 90 degree angle. For them. Um, this seems to have started out as a nine patch, and then she just kept adding. I think pretty much we're seeing the color that it was, although I wonder if some of the tans weren't once red mm. or green. But the shocking pink sort of helped us date it. That is a color that they really could not obtain until maybe the 1940s or 50s. So it's a mid 20th century. 
beautifully quilted in what my uh, pen pal Terry, uh, I can't remember Terry's last name, but she calls it variable fan quilting. And I had never noticed it until she brought it up. But you start with a, with a fan pattern in the corner and then you just work free for it. Um, it's not marked. And pretty soon the lines are continue the same width, but they're not following the same pattern. And I think this is sort of the thinking, you know, in the blocks, all cut squares, but um, a nine patch is, and you can see the nine patch goes on. And someone once said, I don't know how accurate this is, that quilts might be the uh, visual form of jazz. And you really do get a feeling that these are riffs on the nine patch. So uh, from the friends. Uh, I, th I think one of the <clears throat> very first arguments that Barbara and I got into is she does have a tendency to say anything that's tan used to be either red or green. It had to have been. It couldn't be tan. But uh, your argument. <laughs> Can you? Point. You know what this quilt, what it most closely resembles, it, uh, uh, I didn't see that when I first saw the pictures of it, is a Lindsay Woolsey. Mm -hmm. Look at that. It's like those solid. Lindsay Woolseys with the solid colors and the big triangular set, setting pieces and everything. Uh, it's like a 20th century version of a 1700, late 1700s quilt. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the graphics are just incredible. Incredible. Is, can you tell me about the binding? What, is it original to the quilt? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that as a, not a dealer. I don't look too closely. And I don't, since I don't have it here, I don't know if it's the back brought over the front, which you often see, because it's fairly, fairly wide. My, um, what I'm curious it's really stuck, doesn't it? I almost rolled over with batting in it. Yeah. Um, my curiosity is about whether the person who made the quilt finished it that way. In other words, uh, is it possible that she got as far as making the top and was going to I mean, we don't know, but I, it, it's just a, a, seems to me a possibility that she uh, made it, she screwed up, she was going to either square it off or just leave it because it wasn't meeting the rules. Um, so that's why I asked about the binding. Yeah, that's a good point. I've never thought about it. I just, again, it seems so, so much of itself that I've never questioned how it came to be except for that idea of the rip on a a theme, uh -huh. and uh, when I get it back, I'll look at it more closely. Now we have another one similar to this. It's not square that we'll talk about. Uh, I, I think it's really important, though, what, uh, Julie. What you're saying implies that this woman thought there were rules that she was breaking. There was, and I think that uh, 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 quilt makers before the present era. Um, thought they were doing something completely different than we think that we're, we're doing, you know, since the 70s, since there became all the competitions and judgings and all, all of that stuff. It was not, I'm sure there were people who thought it was only proper to make things a certain proper way, but it was, it was a wide open field. It, it, I, I don't think that we can speculate that she, uh, didn't like what she had made and so decided to just finish it up anyway or something you know what i mean that, she, that she, i don't think that we can speculate that there, that she that the quilt maker uh had any qualms about binding this thing in a non-square format why couldn't she have thought oh oh that's cool oh this is fun <laughs> you know Joe, you're putting words in them now. <laughs> well, what I was doing here, Joe, was um, looking for clues that might give us some indication of her motivation. Yes. We certainly don't know her motivation or what her aesthetic was. But it's so unusual that if the binding, for example, if the back and the binding, for example, we could determine were 40 years later or something like that, that would give us some, some we're just um, yeah. Maybe something got trimmed off and yeah. What we're doing. 
Clues in the clues in the non calicos. Non calicos. Clues in the solids. Doesn't it's solid. it's so fantastic, is it? It's so fantastic. I'm with I want to say, I'm if, you, if you didn't understand what I was talking about, the variable fan, look at the top and see how the quilting is in fans. And it's Kerry Clausen who calls it the variable fan. It starts out as fans at the top and just gets looser and looser as it goes mm -hmm. down. Yeah. So I just popped over and had a look at it. It's the back is to me, and I, I, I'm not a quilt expert and I don't come from a quilting background. So take that with for what it's worth. Um, the backing is a fairly plain muslin, it looks like to me, and it is brought around to the front. Um, it doesn't necessarily look to me like it has been stuffed, um, but it is uh, a fairly plain, and I don't see that the backing um, matches anything, any of the fabrics on the, the quilt top. There you go. Thank you. Your point is well taken, Joe. I, I, I hope I made it clear. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think it's really important not to um, uh, presume motivation or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's interesting. Now we know the back is brought around to the front. So it seems like it's original. Uh, this is its original shape. Mm -hmm. it's Why fascinating. Why do you say that? If it were a top and somebody came along later, filled it and put a, a a muslin back on and pulled it around. It, uh, in other words, the clue to me is Megan just said that the back is does not show up on the front. No, uh, well, uh, it, <clears throat> okay. It's possible that it was quilted at a later date, but to me, it looks like the quilting and the piecing, why there's, I don't see any disharmony between them. Uh, it seems like it was probably quilted at the time it was the top was made. Maybe not. We don't know. But the, but the backing, you know, it doesn't necessarily show up on the fronting. <laughs> no, but if it did, Joe, if it did, let's say the back was the gold color or the or the shocking pink color, then we could reasonably assume that that woman finished the whole quilt. In this case, we just don't know. It doesn't it doesn't tell you one way or the other, but it's you know it, it, there's nothing about it. It seems to me that shows that she finished it all at once. No, you're right. No. This has been going on for forty years, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, <laughs> and it is so much like a Lindsay Woolsey. I love that. It's great. It's so. Super great. Yeah. From the museum standpoint, here's something that we've really noticed and we've really appreciated about this exhibit. Um, that our visitors are spending more time in this exhibit than they have in most of our exhibits. And they're spending more time reading and they're spending more time talking about them with their friends as they come with. And they're, they're laughing. I've been, while we've been on our Zoom, we've had two groups of visitors and I've heard both of them giggle which I just think is fantastic. People don't usually giggle at the quilts that we have on display, um, but they're amused and that's, you know, that's sparking a little joy in them. And from my museum standpoint, I think that's fabulous. I gotta find this feedback. Somebody's got their mic on. Uh-oh. There, I got it. Um, okay. I want to um, throw in a little bit here. Um, <laughs> do you think those giggles are joy, or do you think there's a possibility that people are laughing at the quilt? Oh, you know what I'm just, you know what I'm saying? I do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess I don't know. What What do the rest of you think? Well, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love it, giving a whole long series of speeches. I love the sound of my own voice. I think that uh, younger people that are, <laughs> that are getting into quilts in the last 15 years, say, you know, the modern quilt guild people and the young, and people younger than us uh, that, are, that have just gotten into quilts in the last 15 or 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are greatly influenced by the G's Bend quilts. 
tremendously influenced. I, I don't think we can overstate that. I've talked to so many younger people that that was their introduction to quilts, was seeing the G's Bend quilts and going, oh, I could, and this is something I could enjoy. It's not the stodgy old ones like my mom liked, you know? Uh, and so I think that uh, there's a lot of people that, that, that attitudes towards the rules and stuff have really changed broadly in, what do you all think? Well, I, have to get, excuse me. I wrote the, I wrote the labels and I wrote the catalog and I'm a comedian at heart. So they might be laughing at the labels. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I've, I've had the pleasure of lecturing about these quilts in my collection quite a bit. Um, and there are two diverse, there are two distinct groups in the audience. And one group is appalled and they are dismissive and they are, um, you know, they're superior to these quilts. But I'll tell you what, the other part of the group, and they're also giggling like, ha ha, uh, these are pathetic. Um, a great, a great deal of the audience loves these quilts and they respond to them real emotionally and, um, and, and with joy. They, I think they can see the joy that somebody had just playing with fabric and putting it together and, and doing their quilt, not following rules, not sitting down and trying to make it look like, you know, everybody else's. So I, I have, ex and a lot of people are real appreciative of them. So it's both groups, definitely, Julie. Yeah. Divided by age, can, can you tell? Is that, because I think Julie oh, is absolutely right. Um, There's been an evolution in our uh, appreciation. I don't know, necessarily. I think there are plenty of older people who have, who have appreciated, who grew up with quilts like these. And they see them as a real comfort and they, you know, and they're familiar. So I'd say it's almost more personality type. It would be my feeling, you know, someone who's very, uh, who wants to do everything right. A lot of quilters want to do everything right, you know. And they want you to do everything right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Here are some of the comments in our chat window. Um, Marianne shares with us that comments she's heard are that people who are quilters who are viewing these are feeling much better about their own work after seeing these quilts. I think there's truth to that. Um, Robin shares that she thinks the giggle represents the joy in the whimsy. And I think Jane agrees with her. That that's her reaction. She's feeling more freed about her own work um, and she's loving those quilts and want, wanting to be that free in her own work. Um, I think, here's my former educator soapbox for 30 seconds. I think our education system is really great at a lot of things. Sparking creativity is not one of those things. Um, mm -hmm. Stripping creativity from children, we actually are pretty good at that, unfortunately. And so um, we, we have trained a whole bunch of people who, um, who think that if it's not good enough to perform or, or whatever, I'm also a musician, and the idea that if you're not going to be a professional musician and perform, then there's no reason for you to make music. That's a misnomer, right? If just because you're not going to do something that's quote, perfect, that doesn't mean that's not a reason to do it for a creative outlet. Um, so, Anyway, I think there's lots of people, but what I love is that it's sparking an emotion, whatever the, the cause behind that emotion is, yeah. that it's causing an emotion in our visitors. And that's what I love from the museum standpoint um, for this exhibit. Causing discussion, as you were saying, people are talking to each other. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I think this gives us the opportunity to further break down um, what I consider a misnomer in historical quilting um, is that quilts were just made for, quote, to keep people warm. Um, there's a lot of simpler ways to make blankets to keep you warm. And if that's all you were doing, you would never cut apart fabric and sew it back together in a pattern. You do that because you want to express yourself in some way or because you want to show um, care and concern and love for your family by creating something of beauty. You don't do that just to keep warm. I have said, and it's not true, 
but I've said it many, many times. <laughs> uh, nobody ever had to make a quilt. Right. You don't right. have to right. make a quilt. Right. Yep. It's partly we have, true. We have some great other um, comments that are coming in on the chat. Um, this is a, actually a good friend of mine who has said that um, one could say that the ability to cause emotion is what makes it art um, as opposed to just a blanket. Um, and I think that, so if you're not looking at the chat window, you might um, open that up. It's, you can usually view it from the bottom of your screen. Um, click on the little chat button and it'll pop up on the side of your screen. But um, instead of reading all of those to you, let's go ahead and go back to our um, virtual tour. We took a little, a fantastic little deviation there. So here's the quilt that sparked all of that conversation. It's fantastic. All right, here's another one. Barbara, I think this one breaks the rule again of pick a pattern and stick with it, yes? This is Julie's and that's, that's the point you, and you, <laughs> what, what I love about this, many things to love about this, but she just kind of did again a riff on the hexagon. What can you do with a hexagon? There's many things. And then, oh, what the heck, let's stick a four patch in the side, you know. Totally different scale. So Julie, tell us about this. I don't know so much about it, except that when I saw it, I loved it. And um, there was sort of a, not only a freedom, but a real exuberance about it. But she, pl it, she played. It feels like she played. Mm -hmm. um, with that, uh, just that one uh, shape, except for the four patches. And, um, you know, I'm not a quilt maker, so I, I don't know the process very well, but it, 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 that's what it feels like to me. I, I like what Barbara's saying, that the, the riffing, like uh, she takes one idea and sticks with that for a while. I'll have them go horizontal. Oh, I'll have the lines go diagonal. Oh, and, I'll, and, and so on. Uh, she tries this, then she tries that, and, um, uh, and develops a, the theme, and then moves on to another one. Wow. You know, a lot of us collect. We collect shapes and we glom onto things like Barbara and I do at the Couch at Guild. And, and you can see different eras of fabric in these. And I, you know, was this a person who just kept throwing all the hexagons in a box somewhere and then finally one day just popped them all together? You know, I... That's, that's a thought that she didn't make these hexagons. Maybe not. they found objects. Mm -hmm. uh, that's possible. That's possible. So I think, you know, I have a very short attention span. And sometimes finishing uh, 49 identical blocks is yeah. more than I can do. So I have a lot of unfinished projects. But there, we did have a quote that's in the gallery here. A woman who said, well, I just made a bunch of those log cabins till I got tired of it. And I just couldn't do any more. So then I started something else. And that's sort of the feeling you get here, too. If you've ever made a hexagon quilt, and I've made too many, you really can get bored. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting all those rosettes together. So yeah. let me try this. Let me, oh, let's just try them random for a while. Oh, this line is lovely. Yeah. So I honestly had never heard the, um, the correlation be between um, quilting being like jazz, uh, the musical equivalent. I think that improvisational um, connection is fantastic. And I think that this is a really keen example of that. Um, it's a bit of a hex, hexy sampler. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. I'm gonna maybe pick up the clip here just a little bit because we have several more quilts to go through. We have 35, I think. <laughs> Debs. The cups. Yes. Yeah. This well, one. Now, the rule here is if you're gonna go to a lot of trouble to make a patchwork block, perhaps you should choose fabric that will show off all that piecing. You don't want to start a fight between fabric pattern and patchwork pattern. But then again, maybe you do want to start a fight. Some people see, like fights. Like fights. This, one, this one, I mean, notice, see, you see the clear cups in the solid upper right part. The whole darn thing has blocks, um, the cups, and sometimes you can barely, barely see them, mm -hmm. you know, all through this. Um, I found it in Canton, Texas. Um, it's the heaviest quilt probably in the whole exhibit. It's got a quilt inside. 
So, and it's raggedy. I've looked at it. It also has a back. I don't know if you can show the back. Yeah, um, I forgot to take a picture of the back, but I just did it because I can actually, okay. I'm sitting here looking at that one. So. It's a two-sided quilt. Yeah, and a lot of those are raw edge. Um, uh, for non-quilters, that means they, they didn't turn the edges of the blocks, the cups under. And then here's the back. This I is, I, I'm so front. sad I forgot to take a picture of the back because are they turtles? Are they pigs? Yeah. What exactly are they? Yeah, we, yeah. Raccoons, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they're nothing and we're just trying to make something out of them, like clouds, but I don't know, it sure looks like a head and a tail of some sort. <laughs> and they're all uh, thirsty. They're trying to get around to get a cup of tea. <laughs> I could use a cup of coffee. Well, I love the fact that the back is so austere and cool, you know, and well thought out, and the front is just colorful chaos. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, I got to get back to the other set. Oops. Oh, dear. Now I've gotten all sorts of screens going on here. Those turtle blocks remind me of the first time I taught a quilt retreat and my mother attended. And uh, I gave an assignment to the 30 people in the room uh, to do this nine patch freehand kind of thing. And then I'm walking around and I got to the back of the room and there was my mother sitting there making turtle blocks. And I said, mom, <laughs> that's not the assignment. It's not, there was, that's not what I, she said, well, you never listened to me. <laughs> That's what we call poetic justice. <laughs> All right, what rule does this one break, Rob, break, Barbara? When buying stripes and plaids, be sure to buy extra so one can match up the grain of the fabric. Yeah. Now, I remember reading that in the back of the McCall's dress pattern. Oh, yeah. years, you know? And um, we're so lucky that she didn't. This is Possibly my favorite, I don't know. Um, the orange zigzag, we call it. And we've all made copies. Deb and I and all the people in our sewing group have made copies. And it's been fun. <laughs> this is yeah. probably from about 1910. I had it quilted in the, in the 70s. So the yeah. top is from yeah. 1910. Uh, it was quilted in the 70s. Um, so, this is another yeah. great one. Um, that if somebody wanted to replicate, this would be a really fun one to do uh, as an inspiration quilt. Um, in is, that, is that what you said, Barbara, that, you're, that the, your sewing group, you've all made these? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we mostly took the pattern and the idea of orange and black and white mm -hmm. and uh, went on. I think Deb's has a lot of other colors. It's mostly orange. Mine is all orange, but I think Carol's has no orange in it at all. Right, yeah. But it's the idea of the setting up all those verticals and then having them go different different ways, totally randomly. Um, but it's a one block quilt, you know. It's just it's just that diamond, and then it's a lot of fun to make this one. And this is exactly what would happen if I tried to do a quilt like this with a patterned fabric. I just would not have the capacity. Um, to plan it out so that all of the, the pattern went the right direction because I, I don't know, do you make this in? I don't know. You might be surprised because when you lay out the blocks, sometimes you make them face the right way. I, I cut a bunch of them and then I had to recut them to get some of the stripes going all the different ways. <laughs> so, so, sometimes that's a, a real um, surprise when you're trying to recreate one of these quilts is how much we've learned over the years and how hard you have to work to unlearn some of those things to make these. Sure. Well, well, the other thing to consider is that um, this was made in um, trace it and cut it, you know, days. This was well, not. Yes. Uh, you piece it in strips going this way. Going horizontal. Right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Um, you don't have to do any, anything but straight seams, just lots of them. But she didn't cut any of these um, diamonds with a rotary cutter. You know, it was all put it on the fabric and trace it out, that kind of thing. So then it's a little bit, um, you know, and even though, yeah. as Joe says, nobody ever had to make a quilt. Um, if you were going to make a quilt, you were going to be economic with your fabric. You weren't going to waste it 
um, by making sure that you had everything matching, sometimes anyway. Well, there, now, remember I said I had a degree in psychology, and there's also a lot of people like me with no sense of direction, and a <laughs> lot of people who do have serious learning disabilities, perceptual problems, and uh, might never have seen what the heck we are complaining about. Yeah. <laughs> so right. that's another option. People who see things in three dimensions, um, you know, much more than we do, and dyslexia, you know, being one of those examples. Yeah. So um, another thing Deb has mentioned that I think is very important is that to, to make these kind of quilts, you need to work with a scissor. So you do not, rotary cutting is not your friend. And then Laura Horton, who studies a lot of Southern quilts, one time mentioned a scissors is a luxury in some homes. Rip, you rip. You oh. Knife and you start and then you rip. And that's what you see a lot in, in some utility quilts, all right angles. Well, hmm. as much as you can get with ripping your fabric. Right. No cutting across the braid. Mm -hmm. And she says people do not have a, a sharp scissors or a, a shears. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, that, that's like, the, uh, you're 100% correct. The, and, and the uh, uh, if you use the rotary cutter and you cut a thousand pieces all the same, you know, which is what you do. That's what it's made for yeah. is mass production. So you cut you cut them all right straight across. So you, then all those lines would be the same. They would all be going the same direction. Right. And it becomes look it, and it, then it looks like it was made by a machine, which mm -hmm. is what some people are looking for. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, that's what gives this quilt its life, its magnificent life is the things going in different directions. Right. Um, artistically though, those big black stripes, they're fairly well balanced throughout the quilts, um, as opposed to all being collected in one area. Um, and my friend who teases me that I like symmetry, um, what I really like is balance. So I can, I can get on board with this because I feel like those darker stripes are, are balanced at least throughout. All right, I, I just have to point out in this photo that the dark spot on the right-hand side, it's not a shadow. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yeah, well, what's the rule? What do we break? The rule Barbara? is, again, it's um, don't start a fight between the patchwork and the, and the, uh, the pattern in the fabric. And she's gotten all this trouble to make hundreds of little triangles, and then you can't even see them from a distance. Right. No, Deb, I've been looking at a picture of this one, and I wonder if those greens weren't black ones. I know Joe's going to tell me that, <laughs> that, I, that I should just accept it as it is and not start going, well, what did it look like when she got it out of the frame? They're green, yeah. they're kind of green now, but that black stripe on the right is just so, such a good idea. Right, if the whole thing had been black and this was just a different black fabric that happened to be more color fast, Mm -hmm. um, that really does make sense in my mind. Or could have been greener. Okay. Yeah, this one's mine. I don't know if you can zoom in. Um, the basket handles, as I recall, are they machine stitched, Megan? I don't know if you can get in there. I can't get in that close, but um, I think so. Yes, but, they but are. I, yeah, I mean, there this, you go. Yeah. I like to collect quilts that I like to look at. And I'll tell you what, if, and I hang them on the wall in my house. And if you are laying on the couch and looking at this quilt, you are entertained for a long time because there's just so much going on. I mean, oh, you know, just a million fabrics you'd never expect in here. And I think that's what's the fun of it, really. It's yeah. Black and white polka dots brilliantly. Yeah. She did. I wouldn't, wouldn't you love to know who made this? I would. I, I, ah, geez. I like her already. I know. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and those handles, it's like music, isn't it? It's more, it's more like music. Uh, they're, the way they, they sort of move. If you just read across uh, their poetry. They're, and look at the one on the upper right. It's yes. by 
uh, was it done by another person? You know, sometimes you see in uh, quilts pattern blocks. People did not draw patterns on paper as we are used to doing. But what you tended to do was make a block and uh, maybe give it to a friend and she would copy from that. Maybe that's her pattern block. Could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, the, the rule here is that um, when buying stripes and plaids, do buy extra. And you really have to look closely. This one's one of the oldest in the, in the show. And it's probably 1870s, a log cabin, very fashionable in the 1870s. And you, what people, t I think what, how log cabins got started was people had a lot of very flimsy fabric from fab fashion, wool, cotton blends, wool, silk blends, like chalet. And it really, you can't just piece it. So you put it to a foundation and that makes everything square, but somehow this is never square. Again, I had to put this on a mattress pad, kind of a mm. backing, just so that I could show how wobbly it is. But what the great thing about it is that because she did not use those plaids and stripes, and just like the orange zigzag, um, she didn't use them in the proper fashion. It has so much more energy. That's right. Yeah, it's a little bit harder to see um, the log pattern, you know, the secondary design that comes from a log cabin um, because the lights and darks aren't so contrasting. Um, but there's really some fun fabrics in here. I love this blue and white plaid here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is, again, unfinished. We have no idea if it was meant to be a small quilt because it's fairly small. Or she, someone said, honey, I'd give up right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's only about two feet wide, um, maybe 30 inches wide, um, and 36 inches long. It's just, it's not very big, but it's it's darling. It could have just, yeah, this could have just ceased to be amusing. <laughs> That's true, too. I made all those log cabin blocks, and I got really bored. <laughs> Now the rule here again is some pieces are too small to save. And uh, the reason people are laughing at, in this show is because I wrote these captions. And in this one, here's a story I've heard over and over that someone died and there was a box in her thing when they went through them and it said pieces too small to save. And when <laughs> I the box, it was full of very tiny pieces. Uh, so we made a little mock up and put it in a case up in, in the show of pieces too small to save. Oh, this great. is remarkable in the diversity. I have never seen anybody use Turkish toweling in patchwork, but this has, you know, textured toweling. And some of the pieces are really minute. Most of them are polyester and it's tied and it is, I, I well, Deb and I should have brought a scale so we could argue over what's the heaviest quilt. Yeah. Quilt. This one's a darn heavy. So we bought this on one of our shopping trips. So. Well, um, um, what comes to mind with this is, um, I've forgotten her last name. Um, Williams. No. no. Molly. Molly Epton? Yes. Right? The young woman yeah. who... Yes. Yeah, so the new... yeah, that. <laughs> Say that again? Oh, okay. Molly Epton, who was one of the first art quilters in the 70s. Right. And, and am I right that it, it's dragging her to me? Yeah. Yes. Molly Efton. And you know, Nancy Halpern, too, when Nancy was starting uh -huh. to make quilts, right. that, yeah. that kind of architectural, three dimensional stuff. Yeah. And this, of course, is, is not planned out, you know. It's just. No, that's right. Uh, but look at the, the, <clears throat> the construction once again. Uh, could you back out just a little bit to go full scale? Yeah. Uh, because what's super cool to me about it is there's this large triangle in the middle, the, the large triangular area with the, the long side on the left, and it angles up above the middle. 
and angles down uh, to that same point. And outside of that triangle, above and below are all the little scale pieces. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's like a wave that, that, that no, you're that's right. rolling across it or something. It's, it's, it's very, uh, <clears throat> it's actually kind of consistently made that way so that it's, um, you know, it's not like thrown together. It's constructed in this, with that really cool visual effect to me anyway. Mm -hmm. you, you really oh. see it well in the slides, you know, even seeing it in person, I didn't notice the, the three dimensionality of it, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the organization of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a technical question as a non quilter. Mm -hmm. um, how would she have organized this? I'm assuming that <clears throat> at the time this was made, people were not using design walls. And design floors. Design floors. Design beds. Design beds. Yeah. I see rectangles and squares in there. But a lot of times, and this is sort of related to crazy quilts, a lot of times people would organize a crazy quilt into rectangles and squares set it together and then applique something over the seams. Mm -hmm. And that might be the case here too, because I can see some linear organization. There's definitely linear organization, north and south and east and west. There's, there, there, it's made in chunks. That's the way you make something like this. Yeah. You make one chunk. Like if you start at the upper left, you can see that there's a block. It's, it, it's a block. Uh, yeah, that purple striped thing is the bottom of that first block. And there's another one right beside it. And that's another block. There's another one right beside that. And so on. And so that, and then you reach a vertical line two thirds of the way across there and that goes all the way the whole, right. it looks to me like the whole height of the quilt. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. But, it's, but you make this, you make these chunks and you sew the smaller ones together into a bigger chunk and then you create another big chunk and put those together. I mean, it's that, that's how you do it. That's what it looks like. So to your point that you were making earlier, Julie, Pam Weeks, who is joining us from the New England Quilt Museum, um, Hi, is suggesting Torrid Dwelling by Molly Upton. Yeah. Lots right. of small pieces like this, but well-planned to look like dwellings, and she credits it to 1972. Yeah, that's right. Cool. And then Nancy Halpern's Archipelago, which I think is in the Yeah, name. that's right. All right, so obviously we're in the corner where I'm sitting because these two quilts are sitting behind me, the one that we just talked about and this one. Now this one, you know, it's just so exuberant. And I, I was grasping at straws here. The rule is that applique is supposed to be an interpretation of nature. And that really does, you know, this doesn't really break that rule. This has got Hefley's quilt. And so Deb, who's friends with Scott, borrowed it. So Deb, what do you think? Um, Scott collects, he, Scott has a wonderful eye because he was a quilt concert or a art conservationist at the Nelson Gallery of Art in Kansas City. Um, so he, he collected this. I mean, Barbara and I have just been like stunned. There's a lot of stitching on this. And I don't know how close we can go in, Megan, but it's, it's just so dense, the work on this quilt. And we can't quite imagine how you could sit and work that long, you know? It's just, there it is. Yeah, that's about as good as you can get, but you can see that the, the entire outline um, is like kind of buttonhole stitched. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the rule I might say that this breaks, Barbara, is that if you're going to repeat an applique pattern over multiple blocks, that it should be repeated, it should be consistent, it should be repeated. Um, and whether by design or by accident or by the you know, varying alterations of a template over time, um, the applique pieces change. This one being exceptionally different um, than the rest. So, this certainly is a one of a kind. I was look. I just looked in the catalog to see. He found it in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, the home of the red and green quilt. 
Yeah. 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 The colors are really unique. Yeah. Now, do you, I mean, this is, this is pink, 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 pink. You can see I'm wearing a dark red shirt. Um, do you, but you think that this is the original color? Joe, what do you think? I think so. I think so. I think it's mid 20th century. It might be the era of the polyester blend, you know. They mm -hmm. hold their dyes well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the rule here is don't make something so scary. <laughs> 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 well, and down, like here, down here, I wonder why there was a switch from this reddish, reddish or pink outline to the white, just right here. That's just, but it's just more character, right? It's like, you know, this wrinkle that I have from all of this lapping and this scar I have on my arm from this, you know, it tells the story of me, or at least mm -hmm. that's what I try to convince myself. Julie, here's one of yours again. The treasure of the Yay! Yay! <laughs> um, well, this is a quilt top. The quilt top here was made by Anna Williams. Um, some of you may know her work. She um, lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and made um, a body of incredible, wonderful work. Um, Barbara, I think you know even more about her than I do, which wouldn't be hard. So uh, I, I purchased this top from a quilt teacher um, who was also a collector of, of older quilts. And um, she uh, had reached a point in her life where she wasn't gonna teach anymore. And so I bought the top from her. It's a relatively small piece, you know, uh, Megan, how big it is? I don't know, maybe. Um, I want to say it's about four feet square. Uh-huh. Not quite square, but close. Square, um, yeah. I, I'm going to uh, let Barbara talk about Anna Williams, if you will, and then anybody who wants to talk about the construction and or anything else about it, please go ahead. Well, I don't know much about her. I know she lived in uh, Baton Rouge, and she died maybe 10 years ago. From what I've read she was a housekeeper for a woman and this woman and she kind of collaborated a little bit in that the woman got her fabric and she worked on the machine she worked by hand and she was African-American and so she is, is considered you know one of the great African-American folk artists in Louisiana she I would say she made 50 or more quilts and they follow a theme the theme, the, the rule here is no, no piece too small to save it again. But when you look at Anna's quilts and you analyze them, there is a method behind all this wonderful madness. One thing is that the block does repeat. She will make strings, put them together, then cut the block, say, in half, and then repiece something else into that. And you have to come and examine it for quite a while to get to see that. The other rule is that she has such control of color um, that, and she's just got this disparate bunch of small pieces, I think. She might cut some up. I think we also have to bring up the point here, too, that everyone says, why do you cut up good fabric into small pieces and put it back together? Do not forget that many, many people get their fabric as small pieces, that as garment factory mm. cutaways. And uh, that might be where Anna got a lot of this too, because there's a consistency in the fabrics that's very interesting. So I, I really don't know a whole bunch about Anna Williams, like that she's always been one of my heroes. And it was great to see this in person because yeah. when Rosanna put the sleeve on it, we could figure out you know, there, what her what her pattern and there actually is a pattern in there was. Yeah, Julie, this is such a treat to get to see up close. I, you know, I know Anna pieced a lot of her quilts when she rode the bus, pieced oh. by hand. Um, but we thought this one was mostly machine um, stitched. Mm -hmm. So the pieces are so tiny. Just, it's, just to be clear, when I got the quilt, it was a top. 
but uh -huh. the guy from had put batting and a back on it and was going to quilt it. So mm -hmm. what, that. You're seeing, what you're seeing at the bottom there is the, mm -hmm. I'd never finished it and I never took off the batting yeah. and the back. So um, could you get a look at the seams? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh you yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. we looked at them closely. We thought there was, they were mostly machine stitched. The pieces were machine stitched together, yeah. And there's some lovely photos of Anne in her living room with her machine, surrounded by just piles of fabric. <laughs> well, and then she relieves us <laughs> by putting on uh, a, a few borders that are yeah. um, more organized and give you a yeah. way contain all that activity and movement and exuberance. Mm -hmm. Anna Williams is a good person to copy. Anyone who wants to try it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I've copied um, several of her quilts and, and we've had challenges. So someone should do this, or at least parts. Look at it closely, you'll, you'll have a blast. Yeah, what year do we think Anna was really, or what years, what time period was Anna really active? Do we have an idea when this might have been made? 70s, 80s, maybe okay. into the 90s. You know, 1970s, 80s. Um, somebody thinks that there are a couple of Anna's quilts at the International Quilt Museum. I assume that's what they mean by IQM. We are IQM as well. Um, and she included in Patricia Crock's crew at all at Wild by Design. Yeah. And, and the Brooklyn Museum has one. They're quite collectible. Julie, really, you're fortunate to have this. Yes. 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 So now, Julie, you made the distinction earlier about um, quilts that you see as a dealer and quilts that you keep as a collector. Now, the ones that we've seen are part of your private collection. Is that correct? Uh, so far, yes. And I okay. think I'm not remembering the other two that I, um, that I went to the museum, but Probably all of them are from my private collection. Okay. At one point, I, um, Joe and I lived close together and were very close friends. And um, I asked him what he would do with this quilt in its current shape. And um, should I have it quilted? Should, what should I do? And um, Joe's idea was that together, <laughs> he, he and I could tie the quilt because I'm wondering actually now that I think about it, how Anna finished the quilts. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody know? Uh, you know, mostly, mostly she made tops. Um, she didn't quilt them. Yeah, she was a piecer. Oh. Yeah, I have I read. The batting's good in there in the back because it supports it. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to have done. Yeah, I mean, it, it shows beautifully. Um, and uh, to answer, um, respond to you, Megan, um, this is in my collection. <clears throat> it, you know, the things in my collection, I'm old, and one day they won't always be in my collection, but this is something that, uh, it's collectible and somebody would want it, but the con you know, in its present condition, it's, uh, because it's so collectible, I guess I could sell it as is if I decided to do that. But right. most of the quilts that I, that I sell are um, in very good condition, <clears throat> very good condition, um, which is what the customer wants, especially these days. Right, yeah, sure. So I'm looking at the clock here and we're coming up, it's just now two o'clock, which means we have been going for an hour and a half. <laughs> and I'm guessing that it's probably wise of us to wrap up a little bit. Um, but I'm also looking through our collection and saying we've gone about halfway through the exhibit. Um, so what I think I would be best for us to do is I'm just going to take a quick little um, gander through the rest of our collection so everybody can get a little teaser. Um, and we've had, a, um, we've had a little drawing added to our screen here, but um, I'm just going to cruise through the rest of our collection, uh, the exhibit rather. Um, to entice people to come to the Iowa Quilt Museum and see it. Um, this collection of quilts will be on display through October 4th. So we have all of August and all of September remaining. Well, whatever's left of August. Um, oh, this one. 
Oh, we got it. And what I'm hoping we can do, um, Julie, Barbara, Deb, and Joe, is to schedule another time where we can get online and talk about the rest of these quilts. Um, but I'm thinking that anybody who hasn't been live with us um, can watch the video, that we will put that up on our website, um, that an hour and a half is probably long enough for that. Definitely. Yes. There's more fantastic quilts. There's lots more to talk about. This is actually the one right here um, that inspired the, um, the docent I was mentioning earlier to make a quilt. So anybody who is watching this, um, if you are inspired by one of these quilts to design your own quilt top, we would really love to see that. Um, and we're going to um, organize a bit of a, I don't know if competition is the right word, um, but a little um, incentive maybe for people to share those quilts with us. Um, Carrie says, this discussion has been fascinating and she could listen all day. I agree. Um, I have not felt like we've been online for 90 minutes at all, yeah. um, but, <laughs> but we do want to respect people's times. And unfortunately I have a 2.30 meeting. So um, <laughs> we'll wrap up today, but on behalf of the Iowa Quilt Museum, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today, um, especially to Barbara and Deb who curated this fantastic collection. Um, to Julie and Joe, who have shared wonderful information and insight with us. Um, I'm going to share a couple more things in the chat window right now. And the first is our, um, shoot, I just shared that with Mike and Sue Ellingson instead of the whole group. Here is the <laughs> Iowa Quilt Museum website, which is just iowaquiltmuseum.org. If you stick a donate on the back of that, museum.org slash donate that takes you to our um, online secure donation form and if you feel that you're compelled to share a financial donation with the Iowa Quilt Museum we would be so grateful for that um, that of course allows us as a nonprofit organization to continue to provide um, programming like this and exhibits we actually change exhibits four times a year um, um, there's a year coming up soon where we will actually have five exhibits in one year um, and so we're really fortunate that we get to rotate through and change things all the time. Um, Barbara, you alluded to a, an exhibit book that you were looking at earlier, and I'm gonna pop up the link to our online gift shop, I think, anyway. <laughs> um, where that is for sale. We just got our deliveries of that book, compliments of, are you showing one? Oh yes, yes, that's the back side of it. Oh, you show yours, Barbara. You've got the front and Deb's got the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a link to our online store where you can find this exhibit book that has pictures of all the quilts and the signage that comedian journalist Barbara has written. Um, that they're just really wonderful to read um, and there are lots of other things available through our online gift shop as well because I know some of you are not from the Iowa area however if you are going to be um, probably not Elaine because she's in Canada um, and I know that somebody is online here from the UK as well um, but if you are somewhere near ish to Iowa and it's drivable for you we would love to have you come visit we are open seven days a week uh, 10 through 5, Monday through Saturday, and 12 to 4 on Sundays. We do have a few um, guidelines in place, um, but as a smaller museum, we're not dealing as much with crowds, um, and we are in, so we are encouraging the wearing of face masks, although we're not requiring it. We do have some traffic flow through the museum to keep people apart from each other, um, but we're, we're very much ready to welcome you here at the Iowa Quilt Museum. <clears throat> um, anybody else have anything to say before we close up? wanted to ask if uh, we do this again and I would be delighted to do so. Uh, Hang on just okay go ahead Julie. Will there be questions and answers because I'm sure that there are people who want to know some things from. Yeah yeah we can absolutely do a question and answer part and we had lots of comments come in um, throughout the throughout the chat um, but I, I think a Q&A would really be wonderful. And during that Q&A, we could go back through these quilts that we touched on today as well, um, not just kind of the second half. So we will definitely schedule that. We'll, the five of us will coordinate our schedules um, and try to do that sooner rather than later so that people can join on and kind of take in part two of this fantastic um, online gallery walk that we've got going on. So anything else for the good of the order? Thank you, Megan.
Well, thank yeah. you so much, Joe and Julie. It was wonderful to meet you today. And Barbara and Deb, it was great to see you again. Thank you to everyone who joined us online um, here from the Iowa Quilt Museum. We're happy to host this event and we hope to see you in person sometime soon. Have a wonderful afternoon and happy quilting, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.